I'm Dr. Scott Masson here with my colleague Bill Friesen here talking on Paideia today about the modernist poet T.S. Eliot. Eliot is a figure uh, who is uh, inseparably linked with the modernist movement in poetry. He is also uh, often seen as an Englishman. You know, he eventually became a part of the Church of England and a monarchist and so forth, but he was actually born in St. Louis, New, uh, St. Louis uh, Missouri, uh, and he has a claim to fame on both sides of the Atlantic for that reason. Both, uh, both the Americans and the Brits like to claim him as one of their own, but he did renounce his American uh, citizenship, uh, uh, I believe in 1927, uh, when he became a Brit, and he uh, lived and did much of his greatest work there. But I think there's uh, uh, the, the poem we're going to look at today, uh, at least primarily, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock was written before that time. Um, he also was a convert to Christianity later in life. So that's also an interesting uh, feature of his uh, discussing his uh, entire corpus of poetry, and indeed the man himself. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Friesen. Uh, Friesen uh, is more than I a commentator on the modernist period. I am no great lover of the period, um, but I find it very interesting. But let's get into that today and we'll talk about why I don't like it and why you do like it. And that might add some spice to the discussion. Bill. Yes, I'm going to start with a reading here from the first and okay. second stanza of uh, the love song. Um, but one of the things I always tell my students, especially if we are studying something, uh, if we're studying literature historically, uh, at this point, usually in my courses, they have become familiar with Victorian writers like Robert Browning, Elizabeth Browning, uh, uh, Tennyson, uh, maybe the Rossettis or somebody like this. And there's kind of a, a very Victorian feel to a lot of those poems and a lot of that poetry. And if they have then not had any experience with the fin de siècle uh, writers, people like Houseman and Hardy, who we discussed the other day, mm -hmm. um, then when they pick up this particular poem, they find it absolutely shocking that such a thing as this should be anywhere vaguely chronologically in the proximity of the stuff they had been reading from the 19th century. And there are a lot of fascinating reasons for that. So let's get into the weirdness that is uh, this poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And I'm just going to read the first little bit. I'm not going to read. It starts off with a, a quotation from Dante. Yeah. And maybe we'll come back. We'll talk about that. But I'm not going to attempt to read that because... In Italian, for that matter. In Italian, because um, one of the things that uh, is uh, so striking about T.S. Eliot is the man is ridiculously learned, and that includes when it comes to languages. He was a big lover of languages. Um, but I'm going to skip that chunk right now for the sake of not uh, slaughtering the pronunciation of Italian and dive straight into Eliot's response. And it begins like this. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Hmm. And then so it proceeds from there. Um, and my own, you're right. Um, I am, I wouldn't call myself always a fan of modernist literature and modernism more generally speaking. I'm fascinated with it. Um, I almost heeded the siren's call of modernism when I was doing my master's studies and then would have directed my PhD studies in that direction. But luckily, I was wrestled back to sanity by early medieval studies, and that became my main area of focus. Uh, T.S. Eliot, likewise, as a writer, I have quite a vexed personal relationship with the writer. Um, first of all, I hated him. When I first encountered oh. T.S. Eliot, and for the first couple of years of me reading T.S. Eliot, I loathed Eliot in ways hard to put into the English language. 
And there were a couple of reasons for that. The first one was that I was introduced to T.S. Eliot without any of the background knowledge or foundations I needed to understand what Eliot was trying to do with the poetry. Whether my professors were neglecting that or themselves did not know that, I suspect the second. Yeah. Um, in any event, they simply didn't meaningfully equip me or any uh, anyone else in those classes to grasp what we were looking at on the page. And then the second part that made it even worse, then they marked us on what we did not understand. Um, and this is a magic combination and I took the lesson with me. Um, so they gave me an impossible task and then gave me an F for failing at the impossible task as they did with everybody else in there, unless you were really good at navel gazing and speaking in technical terms about stuff that didn't ultimately mean anything. Uh, those people occasionally got rewarded around Elliot, uh, but not me. That, that was my impression of modernist poetry, to be honest, and I, I avoided it like the plague. Much of it actually is that way. Eliot surprised me by, upon closer scrutiny, not being, not not being one of those one of uh, those individuals. But there are plenty of those individuals in modernist uh, literature, and there are even more of them in postmodernist literature. Mm. So it's a thing. Then um, I was flying uh, uh, at a certain point from one side of Canada to the other, and there was a stopover in Calgary during the winter. And we suddenly got snowed in. Uh, snowstorms can be very sudden out in Calgary, just off mm -hmm. the Rockies. Mm -hmm. And I was trapped at the airport. And I had only my little backpack with me. And by weird, weird, and I thought singularly tragic uh, coincidence, I had exactly one text in that little backpack. And it was this text over here, T.S. Eliot's collection of poetry. So it's like being stuck at an airport in close proximity with somebody you loathe, and they won't shut up. Um, I went to the bookstore hoping to find anything more palatable, even the uh, worst work of pulp fiction I thought would be preferable to this dark fate, um, but they were closed. So there I was grumbling and what have you, and as the boredom set in, as you know, I'm a person who's easily bored, eventually I dragged out the, uh, the, the anthology and began reading. Now with no purpose in view, I wasn't rushing, I didn't have a schedule. Uh, I was simply killing time and reading slowly and languorously. Now, having had a couple of years of training in, lit uh, in how to read literature productively. And slowly, uh, after one reading, after an another and another and another, slowly, structure began to swim out of the page at me. Uh, directions, connections, meaning, purpose. Uh, I began to see how it connected to other prior works of literature and other works in culture, more broadly speaking. <clears throat> And all of a sudden I realized actually, Eliot didn't belong with the rest of the poets. He was actually doing something and something meaningful and possibly maybe even valuable. And in the year after that, I met a fabulous uh, professor who was a professor of modernist literature, uh, Dr. John Cooper. And he drew alongside me and uh, we talked a lot about our readings of Eliot. And um, that opened up the world of T.S. Eliot to me. Do I still have problems with T.S. Eliot and what he's doing in his poetry and what he's doing with culture? Um, yes, I do. There's a, I, Eliot has a lot to say about a lot of things. If you're at all interested in these matters, you're going to find points that you can disagree with and, and should disagree with. That's fine. But nevertheless, I find him fascinating, uh, sometimes fascinating, a little bit like a, a fascinating car accident that you're driving past, but nevertheless fascinating. Now, you, on the other hand, are really not a fan of the form of the love song, which is the dramatic monologue. Um, it, it vexes you greatly. I have, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, dramatic monologue seems to me to be a, in terms of a, as a form, uh, seems to me to be a relatively recent invention, uh, probably from the 19th century, you can see something of this. Uh, I'm no expert on that particular uh, feature per se, but I know it it takes on its own life in this period, particularly in the works of Joyce and so forth, and the idea of a stream of consciousness. I see a dramatic monologue represented in a soliloquy, a Shakespearean soliloquy. So it's a, a character speaking uh, front and center on the stage, coming and revealing his mind to the audience as Hamlet soliloquies often do and so forth. Uh, that is a functional dramatic mo monologue within the context of a play. The dramatic monologues that uh, Eliot is writing, say, for example, in this love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, 
there is no audience per se. Um, the actor or, or the speaker, uh, and we should not assume that it's uh, Eliot himself speaking here, and I'm, it's quite clear it is not. It's uh, somebody who represents a type of man in his era, his time, speaking plaintively about uh, his anxieties and fears and so forth. But I don't think that it is particularly edifying. I don't see the genre that it fits into, and I don't think that it speaks to the common complaints of mankind or the common delights of mankind. They, it is very much typical of its period. So it does express the anxieties and dislocations of modernism after the First World War or even in the First World War and the crises that have emerged uh, from the anxieties and, and the, even the despair that we've spoken about in, in Houseman and Hardy and others leading up to this period, I can see that. But still as poetry, as something that I ought to appreciate, uh, I don't, I simply don't, I don't appreciate it. I see it as a, yes, it is a product of the age. Okay, uh, in that sense, it's a cultural product, but I don't read poetry as cultural products myself, let alone the anxieties of a particular age. I, I want a, a quality of timelessness to it, which Eliot himself refers to in the part of the great tradition, and I don't think his poetry actually expresses that timelessness. It's very, very much the product of its own age. And for that reason, I find it not very appealing. That's about yeah. it. Yeah, and you and I have discussed this as well. Um, my view here is that uh, T.S. Eliot certainly knows the great tradition. He knows the great conversation. He understands it very, very deeply. Um, but yet he is not trying to access right within that. Directly. Right. No, he's trying to build the next step on top of it, uh, speaking back to it. Um, now, whether that's a legitimate undertaking, you and I can uh, discuss. But uh, sure. nevertheless, that's that's the product. I uh, that's the project I see him embarking upon. Because the main character of this, uh, this the, the love song is Proofrock, the famous or infamous Proofrock, who is said to be. Elliot said he was trying to write um, a character into this dramatic monologue, who was representative not only of uh, his cultural era but caught the zeitgeist and more specifically diagnosed the fundamental overwhelming existential problems with this being the new type of man that we encounter in the modernist period. Because proof rock, this is not a celebration of proof rock, quite the opposite. This is a, a ringing condemnation of this kind of man, this kind of artist, this kind of lover specifically. And we'll get into that too in just a bit. But I would say something that maybe the audience will find useful. T.S. Eliot said elsewhere that there are three ways that you can approach persona and narration as it flows from persona. He said, you can either have the uh, author speaking to himself, you can have the author speaking to an audience or his favorite, which is what we encounter here, um, a made up carefully constructed um, persona, who's kind of like a work of art unto themselves even before they be begin speaking because they have so many details to them, speaking then to um, an, uh, an idealized, that is to say, also constructed audience. So he's anticipating an audience, but it's not actually you and me. Uh, T.S. Eliot had designed a fake fictional audience in his brain to whom this would be read by a persona who is a careful artif uh, a constru a constructive artifice as well. So whether or not you agree with those, uh, the, those of the three, as the three breakdowns, T.S. Eliot did have that in brain explicitly when he's writing a text like this. Um, and my, my critique of the modernists as a whole is that they are elitists in the sense that they write for a quite, uh, I think, quite obviously limited audience and they have no appeal to the common man, nor do they seek to do so. And I, f I find that uh, deeply problematic. Uh, and I, I don't think that poetry has ever recovered from this project, this modernist project and the postmodernists that succeed upon the modernist project are guilty of the same sin, more or less. They do not tie in with the concerns of common concerns of mankind, uh, whether in their joys or in their laments and so forth. They rather, um, it's more of a historicist project. It is uh, an engagement with the past, but almost like uh, uh, it's, it's, it's built on it rather than built out of it. It, it, it does talk to it, there's no, and it's aware of it, but it doesn't have the same uh, 
presuppositions, the same concerns. It 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 is distant from them. It fi it finds itself dislocated from it. That's one of Proof Rock's laments. I understand that. Mm -hmm. All the same, uh, is that truly poetry? I realize it has the form of poetry of sorts, although the form mm -hmm. itself is a little bit odd. Like look at the look at the style of this dramatic monologue. Um, look at the form of the verse. It's a funny old form, isn't it? It's all over the shop. And by the yeah. way, there's a few things I should say there immediately. If anybody might be thinking that Dr. Masson is being somewhat unfair to T.S. Eliot, calling him things like elitist and what have you, let me know immediately. Yeah, and in case the listeners might be thinking that Dr. Masson is being unfair in saying these things about T.S. Eliot, i.e. he's a, an elitist or something like this, you should know that T.S. Eliot himself happily and loudly declared that he was elitist during his own lifetime. He has no problem with being called such things. He did not think that that was necessarily going to attach to him as a charge of snobbery. Um, and But uh, as Dr. Masson and I... How do I mean it that way? <laughs> yeah. It's that your, your, your concern, if I'm getting this right here, is that he is saying things which, because of their perspective and specialized nature, have little relevance to the common reader and uh, is stuff designed largely for a idiosyncratic and highly trained specialist in a certain tiny little field. And to everybody else, it's irrelevant. Is Am I characterizing that correctly? Uh, no, that's more or less correct. And I think by so doing it, it totally avoids the the uh, the greatest poetry and what the greatest poetry actually does. The very tradition that Eliot himself celebrates still appeals to its audience in a way that is un, more or less undiminished. You can read Homer, you can read many of the poets that we've celebrated in Paideia today, and you can still enjoy them with a little bit, sometimes a little bit additional information, but nonetheless, it is highly enjoyable. Modernist poetry is not highly enjoyable, and it's almost inaccessible for all but those who are um, adopting the rules of the game and so forth. And academia has followed down that narrow path. And I would say that by and large, the reason that it has no public appreciation is because it it scorns it. It does not want it. And at the same time, it complains that nobody takes them seriously. Well, I think they, they get what they deserve. Yeah, it's true that the academy has been complicit in the death of poetry. And I use the phrase advisedly here. But um, I can be more or less certain, even in a university literature course, that if I ask here, uh, if I ask a body of students who here reads poetry for pleasure, I'm lucky in a class of 30 or 40 to see even one hand go up. It's usually, yeah, it's usually nobody. Who would? Um, the bottom line is, as to quote the tragically hip, who cares what the poets are saying? Why would you? Um, having said that, uh, T.S. Eliot, and uh, again here, I think I disagree with him for once, um, but with many qualifications. I think the T.S. Eliot would have said that there's no going back for your average, your average reader, your, your average denizen of 20th century life and modernist life specifically and targeted. So I've got to speak to this new, strange, stunted creature that is the proof rock, and I can't get away from it. So I'm going to try to be honest and actually speak to that guy. Um, notice also that Eliot knew that he was in a period of great spiritual cultural dryness. These are terms he used all the time in his poetry, in his essays, in his all his work. Uh, he thought that his age was absolutely infertile. It produced no thing of life, whether that be in art or other senses. It was a desert. Thus, his most famous um, collection of poems, The Wastelands, um, and what he has to say there. In some senses, for the sake of pragmatism, we've gone for uh, the love song of J.L. for Prufrock, just because it's more workable. But if yeah. you want a big magnum opus, well, I would I would say start with the Wastelands and then go to the Four Quartets, but that's a different discussion. Anyway, yes. um, he knew that he couldn't, his average reader couldn't actually see his references, his uh, um, allusions to all these great thinkers, whether they were philosophers or writers or playwrights or whatever they had been in the past, either Renaissance, he, by the way, he was fascinated with the Renaissance period. He absolutely adored the Renaissance writers. Uh, but he knew that his average reader just was not going to get any of those references because that kind of reader had died out. Um, now there were only a tiny little dwindling amount of them who knew that stuff and an infinitesimal, infinitesimally smaller group who actually appreciated, liked, and celebrated that world. 
uh, the few who knew usually denigrated it in Eliot's time in order to kind of wipe out the last vi uh, vestiges of those great traditions and the great yeah. conversation. Yeah. So he actually went to the radical step, and this, is, this generates a bit of sympathy on my part for T.S. Eliot. He actually went to the radical step of footnoting a lot of these allusions and references and things like this in the first and second editions, what have you, in the favor and favor. Um, so he's noting his own poems. I mean, <laughs> but, yeah, extraordinary, really. If you know the tradition, this is this is insane. Nowadays, because we have so many readers who struggle with the great conversation, they never even heard about it. Never, never mind its nuances and details and history. Um, that for a lot of these old traditional texts, like the Shakespeare, like the Dante, like what have you. Um, I strongly recommend that the readers get the uh, editions with the footnotes in there that are not just explaining obscure words and phrases, but actually tying back to the great ideas and the texts and the authors that this author is talking about, because most modern authors just miss the great mass of allusions and references and, and how this work, fi work fits into the great web of Western literature, the greats of Western literature. So in that sense, I saw T.S. Eliot in a rather ham-fisted way trying to educate the unwashed masses. Um, he's actually feeling sympathetic towards them. As we're going to see with a few of the other writers that are coming up, they're, on the other hand, impossibly hostile to the unwashed masses, the middle class values and sensibilities that are cranking out garish, kitschy, middle class art and literature, and of course, in our time, television and movies and things like this as yeah. well. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's something benevolent about the man's endeavor as he does this. Did he get it wrong in certain aspects? I'm sure he did. But nevertheless, um, like George Orwell, whose ideas I agree with almost across the board on everything. Do I like the man himself? Yes, I do. I think he has a lot of integrity. I admire him. I think he's totally wrong headed on most fronts, but I like the man himself. Yeah. Others with whom I agree on any number of fronts, I don't necessarily respect them as individuals. I do respect T.S. Eliot because I think it's uh, to use cliched language, his heart was in the right place. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't dispute that. Um, it's, it's more of a general critique of the movement and characteristic, I think, of much of Eliot's own work. I told you um, off camera that I do admire the four, four quartets and uh, I think it's quite brilliant, in fact, and I can see uh, the virtue in some of these poems, but more as a reflection of the the, the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, uh, than anything else. And again, my criticism of them as poetry is they accept something which I think they ought not to accept, which is that they, uh, the modern age, is not going to respond to uh, the themes uh, of poetry of old. I think that we have counterexamples in the period. We'll conclude our series with some from, from Tolkien and Lewis um, in rather more traditional forms of writing. Now, there, there are smatterings of poetry in there, but certainly both of them write uh, not just dramatic monologues. In fact, I can't imagine either author writing a dramatic monologue. They write in narrative um with song in it with lyric and yes all of those sorts of things and there are uh, there's a genuine appreciation i think they do tie in with the great tradition that Eliot sees himself um in alliance with but to some de degree as i say totally disjointed from i don't see him as arising out of that great tradition but i know that many many christians uh of my uh, ilk are would find my position totally <laughs> unacceptable. I think I'm in a small minority on this uh, mm -hmm. within those that uh, might appreciate Elliot that I simply don't. Yeah, you mentioned a couple of things here that are important also to Elliot. I mentioned that his main project, I think pretty well all his life was writing back into, so, it, well, it's two part. A, diagnosing his the great critic, by the way. Is, what's that? I think he's a great critic. Yeah, he was he was a good speaker. He was a good critic when he wrote essays and things like this as well. Um, this is a, a very is something of a, a polymath, this guy, um, as so many of these authors are. But uh, as I said, uh, he was looking to diagnose and then speak healingly back into the cultural desert in which he found himself. He said uh, he found himself in an age where your average middle class person, which is the main denizen of his world, um, and also the social circles in which he operated, I should add. Um, 
was living in a cultural desert and that life had assumed this cheap, infertile, arbitrary sort of a nature where big universal um, themes uh, which are relevant to the experience of being human, love, death, marriage, um, ambition, name what you will, had ceased to be the living, breathing stuff of day-to-day -day life and had instead become these sort of arbitrary concepts occasionally dealt with in two-dimensional ways in a lot of aspects of his culture's life. Um, so he wanted to figure out why it had got, how it had gotten here in the first place. And then uh, he wanted to explore its, uh, its bankruptcy, its poverty, its, uh, the badness of it, but never like so many modernists simply to kind of uh, lament or even in perverse moments celebrate this. But what are we then going to do about it? So immediately that puts uh, Elliot for me in a different category than so many of his peers like Ezra Pound, just to name the guilty, uh, or uh, uh, Hilda Doolittle, there's another one. Amy Lowell, I'm gonna talk about her maybe if we get a chance later on. Uh, oh, by the way, poets whose uh, reputations have dwindled over the years while Elliot has stayed steady. Yeah. Amongst those who actually still know him. Um, as we've already said, he was deeply concerned that your average um, inhabitant of the modernist age had not been taught the classics, did not understand the, the classics. Even if they were told to read the classics, they would read them without a frame of reference and uh, the culture that makes these works so eloquent and powerful and meaningful and moving and what have you. So even then, it was kind of it was kind of worthless. So he lamented that he was deeply interested in history. And part of that comes out of his early relationship, university relationship with a number of individuals. Um, Santayana, of course, the individual who uh, coined the uh, phrase, those who do not remember their history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. That was Santayana, in case you're wondering where that came from. Um, the anti-romanticism of um, uh, Irving Babbitt, it's another big influence on him. Uh, Eliot initially looked upon the past, especially the immediate literary past with a degree of hostility. It was not a hostility that stayed in place for um, the rest of his uh, years of his life and his career, because obviously if he falls in love with Renaissance poetry, then he's found something back there in the past that is worth looking at and talking about. Um, and of course, also he's heavily influenced and had a relationship with T.E. Holm, H-U-L-M-E, who is oftentimes portrayed as the first modernist of them all. Hmm. Um, Writes an essay called On Classicism uh, and, and uh, Romanticism, right? Yes, correct. Um, and, and, and supports classicism against romanticism. It's a good essay, by the way. Yeah. And I, I share the shared his sentiments. However, I wonder, I'm now surprised to hear that he's a modernist. Yeah, mo say, he's, he's, say some more there. Well, he's, there are a number of notions that crop up here. Um, he's a classicist, as you say, but he's also, um, he wants to, one of the things that surprises people about some modernists is that a few of them, like T.S. Eliot or Holm, deeply want to revivify the presence, the present by considering the past, especially the important elements of the past in its literature, its history, its philosophy, its theology, and so on. Um, so there's a, there's a break coming here with modernists, and they're going to go very divergent ways in the not so distant future. But Holm points out one of these things, and T.S. Eliot was listening around what Holm had to say, um, with the end result uh, that T.S. Eliot, unlike almost all of his peers, is deeply educated in the greats, in the classics, in the great conversation and stuff like this. And insofar as T.S. Eliot is seen as one of the great icons of modernism, and I think just about everywhere you go he is, then he aligns with T.E. Uh, T. Holm and his views on these sorts of things. Um, but Holm was also very famous for a movement that he generated in literary circles called Imagism with a capital I now. So what are, who are these people? The Imagists? I'll say something there. Yeah, I'm reading from my notes here from my, my lecture notes. The Imagists rejects sentimental obstruction or abstractions and concentrates on concrete imagery. So he doesn't want, uh, so T.S. Eliot did not want to wax melodramatic and sentimental in his poetry. And you'll find for the most part, it isn't when you are encountering high emotions in there, it's carefully methodically directed in strategic direction so the the writer never gets carried away with sentimentalism in there so the Almost. image of you and i the lovers being when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table 
that's not very sentimental. No, no not. that's not sentimental at all. In fact, what you just read there is one of the most infamous similes in English literature. Yeah. Uh, when people read that, uh, the critics exploded. Um, I should actually, no, I'm going to finish off imagism. We'll come back, go to, back the, to that. Okay, the, go the crazy on. simile in a bit. Okay, so um, also you're going to notice there's a lot of uh, it's a lot of very striking imagery in the poetry, not just of T. S. Eliot, but also a lot of the modernists. They paint a picture really well, and particularly they paint a con uh, a connotative picture very very well. It's not just that we have concrete images, what have you. The redolent, the rich, the resplendent with all these sort of scintillating nuances of sentiment and not sentimentality, but sentiment and emotion and tone and mood and what have you. The one you just mentioned is one of these things. Amy Lowell, who I spoke about a little bit earlier, actually went so far as to write a little bit of a, a manifesto as to what imagism was all about, because of course she saw herself first and foremost as an imagist. She said, uh, and this is, you can take these uh, assertions and apply these to a lot of modernist poets to kind of make clear what they're doing, what the project is. Uses everyday speech and, uh, by, and avoids cliches. They hated cliched language. They really hate cliched language. One of their slogans is make it new. Um, and this is why you get these shocking metaphors and similes and images and things like this. Uh, and they're ruthlessly hunting for cliched language because cliche language comes from cliche, cliched thinking and cliched emotional trajectories. And this was one of the problems that really bothered T.S. Eliot. Nobody, everybody's living their life by cliches and they haven't, they're not even aware of it or critical of it. And if you try to take their cliches of thinking and feeling away from them, they become quite upset because these are security blankets. Um, but they don't, you don't have to think about a cliche. That's one of the problems with a cliche. You just burble this sort of standard pap out there. It's the standard model of expression around the standard experience. And your brain never has to engage, your heart never has to engage, and you have no living relationship with your your context. It's like what it's really like listening to the radio or television, which is it really does seem to be endless cliches. And or a politician. Much. Politicians do uh, do cliches all the time. Of all stripes, it's not a, it's not a characteristic of the left. It's not a characteristic nope. of the right. It seems to be characteristic of them all. And there are certain, as they call them now, dog whistle. Another cliche, uh, dog whistle issues for their base and so forth. So they talk about certain things, but all of these are just signs that we're on the right side and the others are on the wrong you know so that sort of thinking i i understand the dislike i genuinely do i share the dislike yeah well you can see immediately how it keeps you from engaging in any, any sort of realistic way any any sort of or, uh, organic and individually valuable way with the circumstances of day-to-day -day life it's true it would if that's how you live your life then you have no deep critical engagement at any level um, you also have no sincere engagement, it's a, kind of a side point. Um, and this becomes a major talking point, not just for T.S. Eliot and a bunch of the other imagists of the modernist period. Um, people are going to pick this notion up and run with it later on. Flannery O'Connor writes that story I've mentioned a few times in here already, A Good Man is Hard to Find, where the main character, that's her great sin. She lives her life mentally, verbally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, the whole thing is a collage of cliches. That's what it is. Uh, and that's her great sin. Um, and she only finally breaks from her cre uh, cliched zeitgeist at the end with a, when she's got a gun to her head and death is in the offing. Then all of a sudden the cliches will no longer do and they shatter, interestingly. George Orwell takes this down political roads. Um, when he starts talking about duck speak and things like this, where the politician is up there uh, mouthing the cliches and the brain isn't engaged, not at all. They can just make political noise in a particular direction, dog whistling, as you say, um, but their brain isn't on, their emotions aren't on, there's no critical depth, there's no sincerity, there's nothing there, they're just making political noise, they're not speaking, it's noise, like ducks. Um, there, by the way, there's a subspecies of pastor who does the same thing with Christian language and Christianese and stuff like that. And uh, when I hear that, one of my morbid entertainments is to interrupt him uh, halfway through a sentence to ask for points of clarification. They can invariably never give it because their brain was not engaged critically with what they were talking about. It's, I know it's a little bit sadistic and I shouldn't do it. I'm sure yeah. it's a sin, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it's good fun. Uh, so that's point one. <laughs> point two creates new and arresting rhythms. 
the flow of uh, the, the, the rhythm and meter of T.S. Eliot's poetry is not mellifluous and smooth and predictable. Uh, at times, it is almost impossibly herky-jerky. So it's not um, classical in any sense. In terms no, of this life. is a break from all those sorts of things. Can T.S. Eliot write in the traditional uh, form with the meters and emphases and stuff like that? Yes, he can. He chooses not to. This is not incompetence. This is a choice by Eliot. Yes. Um, and this is another point I have to clear up with my students here. So in um, that sense, he is he's more like the metaphysical poets that he admires rather than the classicists, right? Yes. Yeah, his his rhythm and meter and indeed the mood of the sound of his poetry is very much more like a John Milton or John Dunn or somebody like John this. Or Herbert. Yeah. Yeah. Or Herbert again. Here's another that's another good example. Um, but here's a qualification I need to make with my students because T.S. Eliot is writing in free verse. A lot of people think that is totally unstructured. It is not at all unstructured. It is highly structured, but it's structured in ways that are new and arresting. And maybe you like them and maybe you don't like them, but there is structure there and lots of it. And it me it's central to the meaning of the poem. So don't stop reading for structure, meter, or rhythm. You must, um, but don't. Ex you're not gonna expect what you get for the most part. No, he, he expects you to note the, the, the rhythm and the meter and the form. There's no doubt about it. The sound poetry. connects to sense with T.S. Eliot. Sound always connects to sense. He's very, very good. Um, point number three, addresses any subject matter desired so there's no content proper to poetry. I've got a bit of a beef with that. I think Eliot would have a bit of a beef with that. I think there is content which is more appropriate to the poetic form than other forms of content, but we see nowadays everywhere around us, all sorts of people are treating content in their art, which seems to be ridiculous, scandalous, disgusting. Uh, the content seems radically inappropriate to uh, art and that particular form of art. You should know that that became increasingly popular here with the modernists. Of course, if you remember our previous podcasts talking about Oscar Wilde, uh, though, you will recognize uh, the seeds of this tendency already with the symbolists and the aesthetes who are using uh, hair raising content to shock the middle class audiences um, and to isolate the aesthetics which inhabit only the style of the literature rather than its content. So Bill, the, can you do you see any analogies between the modernist movement in poetry with let's say the modernist movement in in painting like a, uh, the sorts of figures that are in this period the abstractions uh, of uh, that many people associate with you know cubism and dadaism and all sorts of uh, um, movements away from re realism for one sense and even the impressionism of the 19th century and then you get into all sorts of experimental forms where they're they're most clearly not trying to be realistic in their portrait portraiture but doing something different is it is there any analogy here between the two yes there's several things to say on that front that's good um first thing we should say is that we have to remember that the, the modernists are saying we're the pioneers here in divorcing content from style and stuff like this oh, and any yeah. content it's fine to the, this particular style of presentation and stuff like this they're not that's why i was talking about the symbolists and the aesthetes earlier because the modernists don't get these ideas ex nihilo there are there are evolutionary sources to that and they don't acknowledge them properly um remember the assertion of malame which was that the value of art is purely aesthetic and not moral those two must separate. There is no moral or ethical value to any art. It's purely aesthetic, and that's that, which was, in my view, as you recall, lamentable. Well, I also um, think it's a more. I think it's a moral judgment on his part to make that assertion. Even it has nothing. This is a. This is actually a moral statement because it, yes. it suggests that it's possible to do what he's proposing. I don't think it is. Yep. But this also brings up another important thing, according to what you just uh, asked here which is that now we're also at phase two, where now the aesthetic value, which Mallarmé was uh, saying was the exclusive job of art, also gets divorced from art. And the paintings of the 1920s, 1930s, and so on, are as a type, insofar as they are modernist, they're ugly. Um, and, and, they, and intentionally so. Yeah, willfully ugly. I mean, these are distressing. Remember, you and I said this in some podcast long ago, um, that are, there are certain uh, individuals uh, at work in this time, during the modernist period, people like Theodore Adorno, who say things like beauty has been evacuated from the, uh, from the progress, from the evolution of art. 
Well, think about that assertion for a second. That's a shocking thing to say, really. Beauty in any form is gone, and now art is supposed to do something else. What exactly is going to attract people in the future to art, if not beauty? Whether the beauty of morality or the beauty of form or the beauty of whatever it might be, that's the draw. And yeah, so if art is not beautiful, what is it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. And if you, people say, you know, why are the portrait galleries empty? Why are there no great poetry readings and celebrations anymore? Why are there no great works of classical music being uh, at least even attended to? Um, well, they're all uh, written. Yeah. Yeah. Because beauty has been evacuated from the progress of art. Which this is, is my point. The elites have killed it and they've and they've delighted in the killing. And I so, again, I'm not on board with the attempt the attempt I can see what's going on I think it's a failed attempt and I think the postmodernists that arise out of it and respond to it are just recapitulating the same sort of thing like a dog returning to its vomit yep. it's the same thing I'm going to eat that again which I just vomited out that doesn't yep. go anywhere where shall we go from there I that's well, when you and I to discuss Thomas Beckett's Waiting for Godot, we're going to see where it goes. And the <laughs> chilling answer is nowhere. It goes into the abyss is where it goes. The only question left, as Kafik uh, famously said, for the, uh, for the modern man is the question of suicide. It's the only relevant question. Yeah. Why is he saying crazy stuff like that? Well, here we're building some of the meaning of why he would get to that dark, blind alley of existentialism. Uh, the final point that she makes here is it depicts subjects through precise, clear images. That's neither here nor there. Um, but let me back up and talk about that scandalous simile. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening yes. is spread out against the sky like an patient etherized upon a table. All right, the breakdown. It is singularly unromantic, as you said. Um, if you said this to your beloved, um, <laughs> she would give you that look. And later on in the poem, it says uh, she turns over and leans on her, sh uh, on her elbow and says, no, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant at all. You can expect a response in a similar spirit here to that. The breakdown, here's how it, it works typically when I explain it to my students. A simile or a metaphor for consists of three parts, according to I.A. Richards, who is a practical literary uh, theorist at this time. Um, and he said it consists of a tenor, a vehicle, a tenor, and, a, a, and grounds. Maybe I've, we've talked about this before, but it's oh, worth yeah. reiterating. Okay. So, uh, and this is a tool by which you can understand difficult metaphors. Basic cliched metaphors and similes are neither here nor there, but that's the problem. They're cliched. What we've got here by in this simile is anything but a cliche. You did not see this simile coming. This is a weird one. And it stops you in your tracks. And it's right at the beginning of the poem. And it's meant to stop you in your tracks. So how do you make sense of it? I.A. Richards would say, um, when it comes to a simile or a metaphor, um, you have got a tenor, which is the actual literal thing itself. Then you have the vehicle, which is the thing which represents it in sort of abstract terms and then the grounds are the characteristics that connect the one to the other so if we have a cliched sort of a a metaphor uh, like uh, the man is a rat well there is a literal man i'm talking about so that's the tenor there is a rat is there an actual literal rat no there's a figurative rat i'm saying the man is the rat um and then i got to think about carefully about the grounds that connect the character of rats to the character of that man and so i don't know however you might answer i'm sure i'm going to be uh, highlighted for being biased against rats but sneaky, dirty, disease carrying, treacherous, call them, you know, what you like. These are the characteristics in, in the cliched version. So when you're dealing with um, when the evening is laid out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table, we have to locate our tenor, locate our vehicle, and then think about the grounds. And that's where this project gets, this simile gets very interesting very quickly. So, um, is there an evening sky? Literally, yes. Okay, but it's not just an evening sky. It's an evening sky when, when the evening is laid out against the sky. So we need to have the whole phrase in our brain when we talk about the tenor. Is there literally a patient etherized upon a table? No, that's the figurative element. Um, so what is connecting the evening laid out against the sky to the patient etherized upon a table? And my students answer in a million and one different directions on this front. Uh, both of them are laid out, both of them, well, the evening sky, of course, is the time when you go to bed, so it's a time of sleep, there's something about somnambulance about it and stuff like this, the patient has been etherized, and so he or she appears to be sleeping as well. Um, 
uh, nighttime, the evening, uh, in, introduces you the, to the uh, deep uh, human uh, understanding that the darkness and the nighttime are times of comparative danger and stuff like this. The bad stuff comes out at night to get you. Um, the patient also who is uh, sleeping um, is obviously in some form of danger as well. Else, why would he or she be etherized upon a table? They're about for, to indicate? for our audience here. Uh, ether was used to um, a very early form of putting somebody to sleep during an operation. You would be given a mask with ether in it, and it would render you uh, uh, insensible to the operation that was about to occur. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, I forgot here that that might not be. We wouldn't use prepared. ether anymore. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I should have a footnote here at the bottom of my lecture notes in the spirit yeah, of Jeff Elliott. Um, so the, the, the patient is going under the knife. This too is a time of danger. Um, you also have evening introduces the time not only of night, but of course, potentially by way of extension dreams. And uh, uh, is the patient in some dark sense dreaming as well? Well, this is all contextualized by the fact that T.S. Elliott is delivering this to you in the traditional form of a dream vision. Um, this all ties together and dovetails in. I could go on like this for quite a while, but there's a lot packed into that weird simile and you don't have to like it, but there's a lot packed into it. Yeah. So the dream vision, I mean, you can get it as a medievalist. You could talk about this at length, Scipio yeah. and so forth and all the different types of dream visions. The uh, thing that strikes me about it is that it is presenting it in a way that there has been a it's art, artifice has conquered nature and to some degree science has conquered nature with this and a detachment that comes allegedly through science that is knowledge um, and that goes so far as to um, enter the realm of the two lovers because remember this is the love song so that that's what I take from it but you've you've pushed it in a further direction than I would have ever considered by pushing it into the notion of a dream vision that's I that had never even occurred to me yeah, in fact, I'm going to come back and unpack that a little bit when we look at some of the first lines in there, because it looks straightforward until you begin to put it under close reading, real close reading pressure with a fair degree of very particular context uh, that your average reader uh, might not have. But before I get too far from other things I wanted to talk about here, I do want to say this. The modernists, for the most part, ferociously reject the past, full stop. They don't like it. They, when they talk about it, they talk about it in negative senses. This is largely the work of a particularly per pernicious individual by the name of Lytton Strachey, who wrote a text called Eminent Victorians, which became extremely popular and influential in the wake of the Great War. I'm not going to talk about that. He's a nasty character, isn't he? He's a very nasty, yucky, I think I would, is, is, uh, is the adjective I'd reach for in that one. The technical um, term. Yes, the technical term. Um, so the modernists hate the past, um, but you've got some good historians cropping up during the modernist period, some very influential historians. And many of the greatest writers of the modernist period um, think long and deeply about history and historiography and stuff like this as well, usually with the sake, uh, for the sake of lighting it up and condemning it, exposing its evils, uh, an undertaking, by the way, to which we are completely addicted nowadays. Oh my gosh. Um, but we debunk, we debunk, debunking is the character of our age. Yeah. yeah, this is what qualifies for high level scholarship nowadays when it comes to uh, the study of history. This is, this is part of the hermeneutics of suspicion. You can see it from Marx on through uh, Nietzsche and, to, and Freud and to in our day, uh, Michel Foucault. It's exposing um, the presuppositions of uh, maybe polite society of authority, whatever, and showing the, the, the you know, the grubby uh, undergrowth that's there and allegedly thereby, you know, exposing the authorities as they are to bring about, and it has, it has politically revolutionary intent, certainly in Marx's case. Uh, in the other cases, there are probably other motivations there, but in, in any sense, there's very little productive about it. It's simply a negative exercise. Um, intensely suspicious uh, and a, a, a suspicion that cannot be answered um, because the suspicion is already presumed to be warranted. So there is an unanswerable question mark that is being raised and the very fact that you are answering the question shows that you're guilty of the questioner's question. You're yeah, not supposed to, to answer. This. 
we're back into this discussion about arbitrary guilt, um, which some people might find uh, a notion that is counterintuitive. If uh, you do find it counterintuitive, trust your instincts, you are correct. It is counterintuitive. Um, but um, you're right. Uh, somebody else said to me just the other day, one of the major tasks underway right now in the academy and many political circles is simply to pervasively day by day, slowly, gradually, but um, absolutely convince people to hate their history. Yep. Um, if they and hate themselves. where they came from. And, well, by way of extension, of course, you are a product of your history, whether personal or collective. And so if you hate your history, you must by nature hate yourself. Well, such a house cannot stand. Um, and that's exactly the point. That's the objective. Um, but I'm about to start talking in directions which though interest don't want to go to right me, now. Yeah. They are not immediately germane to our, our man here, T.S. Eliot. Um, Eliot's an outlier in that he begins to admire many things and traits of the past. He can't help himself. He's, he's seen the beauty and to see beauty, as Hans Earth von Balthasar would say, to see beauty is to love it insofar as you have seen it. And that's that. You don't have to think it through. You can enhance your appreciation of beauty and love of beauty by thinking about it. But insofar as you have perceived it, you love it. T.S. Eliot saw the beauty of the past, whether those, in intellect, those were in intellectual concepts or the art that was an outplay of those sorts of things, and he fell in love with it. And one of the things he was most interested in, I said he was interested in the Renaissance, but there are some reasons why he's interested in the Renaissance. And one of them is he saw it as the only age, particularly the only literary age, in which there was a perfect, productive, fertile union. I'm going to keep using the language of fertile and infertile in here. Between passion and reason. He said this is the only age that he could think of where these two things weren't at war with each other, but actually came together in some wonderful ways to produce one of the great golden ages of literature and English literature in particular. And he said this is exactly one of the things that we do not have in modern life. Um, so he says you know, your average person's experience of all the, uh, the elements of his or her day come to them in a series of disjointed fragments that are not bound together into in a coherent whole. And he said, one of the jobs of the modernist uh, is to weld these fragments back into a coherent whole. I'd like to read something from his 1921 uh, essay here, Metaphysical Poets, because he's talking about, of course, you and I have talked about the metaphysical poets. T.S. Eliot would have lit right up when he, when he heard that conversational strand. This got him interested. So what he says here, quote, our civilization comprehends a great variety and complexity. And this variety and complexity, playing upon refined sensibility, must produce various and complex results. Okay. The poet must become more and more comprehensive, more elusive, more direct, in order to force, to dislocate, if necessary, language into meaning. And I'm interested to get your response to his kind of setting out of a mandate there as to what the modernist poet uh, does, because I know that you're uneasy about a lot of the ways in which they do business and why they are going in the directions they're going. Um, I don't think these things can be forced. I don't think the means of artifice uh, divorced from nature to use uh, to oppositional terms, nature and art. Um, I don't think art can compel nature to be natural. Uh, I think that uh, at this point, um, they're in the probably the opposite camp of error to that of the romantics, which is they appeal to nature and try to eschew artifice. And here we're getting artifice without any nature. Uh, in both cases, just like you've talked about, this mm -hmm. rooted in the aesthetics movement, the art for art's sake, when they try and divorce uh, beauty from goodness, I think this isn't ultimately or even at that very point, a failed project because beauty cannot be divorced from goodness or truth without corrupting the entirety of the project. I think it's a it's a, at that point immediately as soon as it announces is a failure, goodness and beauty go together, just like beauty, goodness and truth. I don't think these things can be separated and I don't. So I the idea that it should be forced or you've already moved away from the ground of the very thing that would make your art fruitful uh, and meaningful at that point for me. So I don't, I actually don't agree with the reading of the metaphysicals even, the metaphysical poets of the sort that Dunn and Herbert are. There is no doubt 
uh, a dis uh, discrepancy between the way they approach things and the classicists do. Like we, and we looked at this, I can't remember if it was season two or um, when we were dealing with the, the early 17th century and we talked about uh, Ben Johnson as the classicist, for instance, and, um, and the, the cavalier poets, uh, and then juxtapose them to, let's say, Herbert or Dunn. Uh, Herbert and Dunn do break with those forms, but they don't break that far from the forms. I mean, they're not wholly uh, dissociating themselves from class classical sentiments. They are uh, adapting to, to some degree, the disjuncture of their own age. And I think there's something about um, the zeitgeist that's expressed in metaphysical poetry in the same sense that the modernist movement is also expressing the spirit of its age. But at this point, they've now divorced entirely from the classical forms. And again, so let's go back to the form. I said I didn't like the dramatic monologue. You questioned me off air whether I liked lyric poetry full stop. And I said, yes, I did. But they, again, lyrical poetry comes in certain forms. And those forms express, I think, certain rites of passage and human experiences that are appropriate to it. And I don't think that those change, actually. So I do think there's a lament. Um, and, and these are expre expressed even in scripture. There, there is a, a lament that is appropriate and is well expressed. There is a uh, love poetry has certain conventions that are, we can see in classical poetry. We can even see in scripture and they're highly stylized often, like, like there's a shepherd and a shepherdess. Why is that associated with love poetry? It, one might ask that. We note that it is. We, we, I'm not sure we ever got into that or not, but there is a reason why that it, that it, it fits that uh, particular expression. Likewise, um, uh, songs of joy and, and delight, they have a particular, like an ode, a celebration of victory. These things work in that particular form. Modernist poetry uh, turns it back on form as well as even versification in order to try and do it through um, to force art to do new things. I don't think it then is art anymore. That's so I, I can't be more savage in my indictment than that. <laughs> yeah, um, there is a disconnect in modernist writing and even more so in, in postmodernist writing. There's, well, actually, there's a few other things I want to say here on this front. One of them is that uh, in terms of comprehending what's going on between modernism and postmodernism, I've talked already about their fascination with history, but in a very negative sense during the modernist period. Um, so they want to critique it, they want to savage it, they want to get into the hermeneutic of suspicion, they want to do all these sorts of things. Um, so they are intensely critical about their history and their historians and the legacy of that. Um, and they're very effective at blasting it, uh, um, fostering a general popular discontent, hostility and suspicion towards all things traditional and historical, mm -hmm. which T.S. Eliot, by the way, completely laments at every turn. Mm -hmm. um, and we find then when we move into postmodernism that the job has been done so effectively of critiquing and savaging history and all of its outcomes that they then can move on to phase two, which is amnesia and they just wipe it out. We can see why it's a bunch of garbage, why tradition is a bunch of garbage and it's evil. So now having proven that, we can dispense with that and move over and go completely into future looking. Uh, we'll stop, we'll stop reading it, we'll stop asking others to read it and we'll move on and you get to read what we write. That's right. So a lot of times when I mention big historical things in um, uh, big historical and important cultural traditions, uh, uh, in relation to a modernist or more pointedly a postmodernist, my students will ask me, well, don't they know about the history, the cultural history of this concept that they are uh, savaging? And I will tell them quite frankly, no, they don't. They don't have to. They've already proven that that was all garbage and they've moved on to the next phase of what they want to talk about. This means that they're often, they often speak from somebody who has a, a sort of a classical perspective with breathtaking ignorance, saying the most hair-raising things, which if they had done even a bit of reading in some of these areas, they would have approached much more differently and in a much more sophisticated fashion. Yeah, no, um, I, I really see it as the death. It is a, expresses a, you talked about amnesia. It, it induces amnesia. It's the product of amnesia. And it does bring about the death of a culture. There can be no other outcome to that. Um, at least as far as I'm concerned, or, or, or at any rate, it's an experiment 
that has never been tried in human history. And it seems to me uh, that normally things that are experimental of that sort are not going to end very well. Well, we've seen this with decade after decade from the mo from modernism to postmodernism to whatever we're in now. Every decade that pushed the experiment to further extremes and every decade, the outcomes are more deleterious. And we lament, why is this happening? Well, look, if you're doing something and it's, its outcomes are, are bad and negative, then doing it more logically is going to make the outcomes even worse. Let alone saying it was well debunked before so now we can move on i think well actually the original debunking led to nothing but nihilism and despair so perhaps the debunking was a little bit too hasty or ill-grounded maybe we ought to recover what was lost rather than perpetuating the same crisis uh, of legitimation in our work and and again fostering the sort of not only nihilism but as you just said um cultural oblivion. Yeah, you mentioned something else I wanted to also pick up on here, um, which is that one of the things in my humble opinion, good literature ought to do, as far as you're reading it as literature, not mere entertainment, is that connection and connecting to people, some of them living, many of them now dead, happens. Connecting and building community is a good thing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that the project of a lot of modernist and postmodernist literature does literally exactly the opposite. It disconnects you, it disjoints you, it isolates you. Um, and thus, another one of the big identifying features of 20th century culture that every sociologist will talk about is anomy, a tremendous sense of loneliness and isolation. And I know a lot of our listeners are feeling yes. the full real lived weight of that right now during lockdowns and quarantines and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, every every generation we think has hit its absolutely most strident, feverish pitch of loneliness and isolation and disconnect. And then the next generation ups it one more time and one more time. Um, that well, we is have the internet now, Bill, so obviously we're better connected than ever. We're you not right? So yep. this is the counterpoint that's always made. We have more connections to everyone around the world, and there's no doubt about that. I mean, we're in different locations right now. We could be on other sides of the planet so there's a there's a connection that is there uh which cannot be disputed and in that sense uh, there's a a sense of progress there but the detachment and that uh, anomie as you called it uh that also has increased and it's almost that the technology has done it and and yeah. it's the art of, and that so this is my my connection between what we said about our, uh, Eliot's comment about metaphysical poetry the, you know, we're going to force it through artifice to do these things. I think, well, actually, it does the exact opposite yeah. of your intent. It's, yeah, we should, I, I was talking about this to some of my Gen Z students just the other day. And I said, how do you, how do you explain? And I didn't expect, I told them right off the bat, I, you're not going to be able to give me a realistic and satisfying response to this, but I want you thinking Ask about this question. It's really sure. important for you to think about this question, uh, above all, for your generation. Gen Z is the most measurably isolated generation yet on record. Uh, no generation has been lonelier than Gen Z. Um, and by most metrics, and they agreed with this next point, no generation has been more ignorant than Gen Z. Um, and yet you're the generation which has social connectivity or the potential for social connectivity greater than any generation in, in history. You also have access to more information than any generation in history. How do you explain that? How do you square that with the fact that you are lonely and ignorant? Because nobody's ever had better resources to deal with either of those. And, and I'm not powerless. blaming them. I'm not blaming them for a second. I'm blaming oh, wow. all of us because, you know, I, I'm e equally to blame here because I'm part of the ongoing process of culture. Um, but they need to be thinking about this in a big way. How do we reconnect and build community again? I think that's hugely important, especially at the level of the arts. And art that does that in a way that's proper and with integrity um, has my undivided attention, modern art, which is very, very little. Um, and also, you can get endless amounts of information. So we have a quantitative approach to um, knowledge when, in point of fact, a quantitative approach would seem a lot more productive. But then who's to say... Uh, not a quantitative, a qualitative approach, but who's to say which quality of knowledge is better and which is worse? Who's left who can actually do that and help them? And that's a limited number of people. Hmm. 
anyway, again, I'm about to go down another, as you can see, when we get into the 20th century, I've got all sorts of openings which can lead to conversations not directly targeted on T.S. Eliot in this case. Did you want to say anything more about Eliot? Yes, a couple of other things do have. <laughs> Poor Scott. <laughs> Your patience and long suffering. I, I was uh, done. Um, a few things here to, uh, first of all, help readers understand them a little bit better, because I think back to my own frustration. So let's actually put the rubber, uh, rubber to the road. Um, what can help you is thinking about Eliot's writing in terms of dichotomies, tensions between things. So for instance, formal and colloquial language. He juxtaposes these things on a regular basis. And you might not see some of that because it's 1910s, 1920s. Yeah, the colloquialisms on him. Yeah, lost on us. Yeah, so they've got certain things where he's talking about, you know, it's it's time, ring the bell, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, if you go to a British pub in the 1920s, you know what that's on about. Um, last that's the last call. Um, and, and the formal language, a lot of people haven't got serious training anymore in uh, how to speak formally and at the highest levels and what have you. Um, so that too is a little bit tough, but nevertheless, Eliot's playing explicitly and strategically with that tension and everything that comes along connotatively between that tension, between colloquial, colloquial and formal. He does it between ancient and modern. He likes putting them right side by side with each other where they clash. So one minute you're listening to a prophecy from, Sis uh, from Sisyphus or the Sibyl at Cumae, and the next moment you're dealing with uh, some factory worker who's dealing with the filth on his skin and the pointlessness of his life and what have you. Uh, between the sublime and the absurd, he does this a lot. T.S. Eliot actually has a better sense of humor than a lot of people might think from reading his essays and stuff. Um, and irony and sincerity. It's hard to know when T.S. Eliot means what he says. Now, he says things like, you know, it's so hard to say what I mean. Well, it's ironic when a poet says that. Um, and yet that's very thematically important when a poet says that. Like Shelley says that at a certain point. On the other hand, he does prioritize things by the end of his career in certain directions. And there's many different complicated reasons for that. But he moves to England in 1915. In 1927, he converts to Christianity. That was a bombshell to his immediate circles because he, yeah, was, a, be. he was a celebrated figure. Yeah, this is the worst better. thing he could have ever done. Yeah, he's an avant-garde thinker on the edge of really forward progressive thinking when it comes to writing, when it comes to all sorts of matters of language and culture and what have you, and the arts more generally speaking. Everybody loves T.S. Eliot. And then in 27, he does that. Um, and they were outraged. They were shocked. They were dismayed. They were all these sorts of things. And to his credit, T.S. Eliot just serenely didn't care. Um, so we see a big shift uh, with Eliot. We're going to see the same thing, by the way, shock, shockingly with another figure, uh, W.H. Auden, when we come to him. Um, but one of the things then he began to say, which put him at odds with everyone around him who was popular and fashionable at the time in, in artistic circles and intellectual circles, was he said, certain things that we've been denigrating need to be prioritized against the things you're celebrating right now. They said, well, what do you mean? And how dare you? But what do you mean? And he said, intellect over passion. Intellect ought to dominate passion. He said, uh, that's, that's, that's not, in, in my view, you guys are all getting all breathy and what have you. You're celebrating the emotions. You're celebrating being free of spirit and what have you. He says, that's garbage. Um, he says, that's out of control. Intellect ought to dominate passion. Order, heaven forbid, you're celebrating the chaos and the craziness and what have you. Order ought to dominate chaos. Tradition over, uh, ought to dominate eccentricity. Um, authority should uh, dominate individualism. And then he went on and on in this vein. And he said, I'm not apologizing for any of those things. Yes, I'm building a structure. You don't like it. I get it. I don't care. This I, is what I agree with every point he makes there. Yeah. And this is why his later poetry is so productive, because that begins to exactly. supply in a really meaningful way the antidote, antidote to what he has diagnosed in his earlier poetry. That's why, that's why I say I like the four quartets. The later poetry seems to me of a, of a different character than the earlier poetry the or, earlier poetry is a is really good as a an expression of the spirit of the age okay i i get that but as poetry poetry qua poetry it leaves me rather cold and maybe that's the intent and maybe that's part of the purpose is to do that but i don't enjoy it as poetry whereas the, again the four quartets it seems to me are, are they're quite splendid in in many respects
Yeah, there's uh, like I, it, it, like I said, it, it's very useful to read it in binary opposition to the early corpus. And okay. if you only read one half, then you really are not getting, well, it's less than a half if you're only reading one half. Uh, these two things work together to give you something. Oh, more than okay, that's, a, that's, that's interesting. Um, and let me just end here by talking about Prufrock himself just very quickly. He's a well-educated man and he is emotionally dysfunctional. He doesn't work as a lover. He tries to woo this girl. By the way, that's strange stanza. I'm just going to say something about that too. In the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Yes, what's with that? And T.S. Eliot, I suspect, I want to be careful about putting words in his mouth, would say, who cares? Who cares? You're just making artistic noise. Uh, of course, you're making polite conversation about the proper figure of Michelangelo. Does he actually mean anything to you in your real lived life? No, it's polite conversation among artists. They're posers. They're complete posers. Um, even if they weren't posers, they don't feel anything strongly about the work of Michelangelo. Um, they just know that they need to make Michelangelo noises at this point in the conversation. So they do. And who cares? It's totally infertile. It doesn't matter. Um, and this guy is trying to woo a woman of this crude sensibilities. He himself is totally dysfunctional. He's pathetic. Be ready for that. His arms are thin. He's balding on the head. He's doing all this stuff. And he's undergoing moments of self-doubt. He's reading the great works of poetry of old. And he thinks to himself, sadly, alas, this has nothing to do with my real life. This has nothing to do with me wooing the woman. Because remember, wooing the woman sim symbolically will lead to marriage. Marriage will lead to new life. But we're in a desert. There is no new life. It's an empty desert. Um, so what does he do? Prufrock is doomed. He is the last in his line. That's what he is. And that is a ringing condemnation of your average inhabitant of modernist, the modernist Western world, according to uh, T.S. To Eliot. Yeah. So he even says himself he's not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to me. That it's a dramatic monologue, but it's not of the sort of a to be or not to be. It doesn't even have that uh, to recommend it. It is little there. No, he will sing to me. No, he'll wake up and he'll drown. Um, also, should I say something? Let me say one last thing about that first line, just so people are tracking this at the level of complexity that they need to. Remember, the first line of the whole poem is, let us go, then you and I. That's not a straightforward line. Let us go. It's an invitation to go on a journey. Okay. Let us go. So you're going on a journey, not by yourself. So you're going in co a company then. Let us go then. What kind of a then is that? Is it a then of exasperation? Fine then. Let us go then. Are we coming in mid-conversation in media race of something? And is this frustration? Or let us go then at a particular chronological time? Or is this a then of a, some kind of a trajectory of a tedious argument? Remember, that's in the first stanza as well. Have they been arguing? And so in conclusion of what we've discussed so far, let us go then and make our exploration into this thing that we've been talking about. We don't know which then it is. Or is it all three thens at once? Um, and in case you haven't gotten the point yet, he then has a comma. You and I, uh, which is an important phrase in the 1920s, especially in philosophical circles, but I'm not going to get into that. This, uh, this opportunity for connection and communion. It's not just you and them. It's not just you. It's you and I looking at each other as uh, people who know each other as a self-aware individual. And I'm looking you, at another self-aware like individual. Are you thinking like boobers? Yes, that's exactly what I'm taking up. Okay, okay. Um, but I don't have scope to get into that. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting phrase that he uses at that juncture. It's that moment of communion. It also sets up this other figure as kind of a guide figure, which you encounter in that type of dream vision, the oraculum. He's about to go on a journey into a dark inferno, Hades-like realm of death, quiet, dark, industrial city, and who cares where it is. Um, and they're going to go on an exploration seeking wisdom. Let us go and make our visit. Follows like a tedious argument, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is why all these characters go into the afterlife, usually in dream visions, which I would argue this is a form of a, a new riff on the dream vision and specifically the oraculum with a guide who's going to guide like Virgil guided uh, Dante's persona in the Inferno. Anyway, Very as you can tell, I, I think your explanation is more interesting than the poem. <laughs> <laughs> Let us hope not. You won't be getting any poetry from Dr. Friesen for a while. Yeah, no, I, I'm yeah. serious. I Don't think that 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 explanation is is very interesting uh and and highlights what i've often thought about the period which is that to appreciate it you really have to have had such vast learning as you do to to approach it and 
So it limits its audience of necessity to a very few. Um, and again, that to me is at that point no longer poetry in its truest sense, where it has a commonality and an approachability and it expresses the sentiments of mankind as they have been experienced by every human being from Adam and Eve to a present day. So that's that's the problem with it. But with what you just said, I think this is, becomes a much more interesting poem. And uh, I thank you at least for raising that to me. Well, let me draw this all to a close by saying if you do end up reading your T.S. Eliot, don't be ashamed of uh, reading the footnotes at the bottom. Oh, no. uh, do so. They can be highly informative and very useful to you if you haven't had the advantage of classical education or anything like this. Where are you going to get it from? Well, you can get a start oftentimes in the footnotes of texts like this. So uh, that's actually a good thing. Seek it out with footnotes in it. The second thing, which is to leave the listeners with a rather hopeful note here, is that the obscure specialist poetry you're lamenting quite rightly is something which is currently, as you and I speak, under serious challenge in many different circles in many different ways. So you see the American Poet Laureate who came to um, note recently, uh, Billy Collins. You don't have to like Billy Collins, but Billy Collins writes poetry which is striking and accessible and nevertheless says stuff which is relevant to your average reader. Um, that's their Poet Laureate. Um, or if you want to go to an English poet who's currently writing, um, a Generation X writer, Simon Armitage, again, he says haunting, strange, relevant, beautiful things, but you don't have to be a specialist with 20 years training to understand what he might be getting at. Uh, will writers like this be regularly winning poetry awards or literature awards anytime soon? No, they won't. They won't. The people who are winning are people who are popular, and popular, you and I have already discussed what that entails. So don't bother reading the award winners. Read the people on the outskirts who are writing and getting a following without popular fashionable support. Now, having said all of this, we have a uh, another writer. Well, actually, before I move on, is there anything more you want to add about? No, I have, no, I have nothing more to add. I think this was great. Okay. Um, we have another very striking individual coming up in our next podcast. And uh, I know that, uh, Scott, you're a, a fan of this individual, W.H. Auden. I've already mentioned him. Um, who also catches some very different aspects of this age um, and then communicates that on to the far side of World War II in this case. Um, so we're going to come back and have a look at W.H. Auden and explore how that makes this whole picture of this fascinating age of modernism all the more rich. Um, but uh, for now, folks, that is going to have to suffice. As always, I'm Dr. Bill Friesen, and as always, joined by my colleague, Dr. Scott Masson. Take care and good reading. See you next time.